So let's talk about the different types of Arctic governance to show how these uh, overlapping efforts at governing different groups, different interests over different time periods has evolved. So let's start with international norms. Um, inter the international system, you can think of a wide variety of different topics that you've covered uh, in your studies or in your particular interests. Um, it's a set of observable norms that were uh, regarding at least giving lip service towards uh, certain areas like uh, global, global environmental protection, sustainable resource extraction, protection of uh, affected populations. Uh, other international norms would be um, observation of human rights generally defined, giving people voice in the governance of their own country, um, uh, murder. Uh, observable norms, uh, right? It can be a whole uh, bunch of different areas. Murder's bad. Um, some of these norms uh, in this area have led to the creation of the kind of organizations and meetings that we'll see, um, like the Our Oceans, right? An evolving norm that the oceans are something that need to be protected and regulated uh, has evolved um, over time. Uh, we're going to see with the, uh, the Conventions of the Laws of the Sea, the initial um, regulations uh, were quite early, but the interests of other things besides just uh, transport and extraction have changed over time as well, leading to protection. Um, uh, so these uh, these organizations like uh, like the Arctic Council or th like um, the UN Environmental Program or the IPCC can also further or internalize new norms. You think of the IPCC as as uh, as a group that's that's summarizing existing knowledge but then pushing for the need for certain types of knowledge to be developed or regulations to be passed right so this is an ongoing process in which the norms can create organizations but then these organizations can also help um, uh, solidify and internalize these new norms and I think uh, the lack of any systematic change in behavior to avoid these kind of substantial global um, uh, negative economic effects um, is kind of indicates that this norm of environmental protection and sustainable um, environmentally neutral growth hasn't yet to be realized. So I think the international norm for sustainable growth and protection and the prevention of ongoing uh, efforts through effective mitigation hasn't really kind of taken hold yet. Moving on to bilateral cooperation, I think when you're looking at the Arctic, the, early, the earliest example of international cooperative um, efforts that I could see was the 1923 Bilateral International um, Pacific Halibut Commission. Um, uh, halibut's delicious. I haven't been able to find it in Australia. Um, I used to work on a boat in Alaska and we used to trade um, the alcohol that we would have for our guests on board our boat for fresh halibut that the fishing boats that were tied up next to our dock would have. And these halibut are huge flat like fish and they could be almost two meters long. And so as a, as a chef trying to haul on board some of these huge halibuts for, for creating absolute um, uh, huge uh, and delicious steaks, um, it's, it makes it a lot more real to you seeing the production of it and the people who catch it than when you just buy it at the store. But hopefully we'll get halibut here in the store um, in, in Australia at some point. We have great seafood here. I guess we don't really need it. Um, but yeah, like with uh, the Spitsbergen Treaty, an early effort at trying to regulate um, the, what was uh, allowable catches um, in that er area between Canada and the U.S., kind of... Um, followed on by other agreements between Canada and the U.S. We've had a lot of maritime and boundary disputes between uh, Canada and the U.S. over the years. Um, there was a bilateral agreement in 88 towards uh, cooperation around the Northwest Passage, um, you know, the way to try to get across the northern part of uh, Canada and uh, Alaska to go between the, the Atlantic and the Pacific. There's also the 1988 agreement between the government of the U.S. and USSR and mutual fisheries relations, which created the Intergovernmental Consultative uh, Committee. So even during the Cold War, even though it was the last years of the Cold War, there was uh, agreements between the U.S. and the USSR related to fisheries, because this is an incredibly rich and productive area for, um, for fishing 
Um, Alaskan king crab is also something I've seen at Costco, um, but is not something you can get here as readily as you can um, in Alaska. Um, so yeah, areas for mutual benefit between two concrete actors in which they shared a border or a fisheries region. They wanted to cooperate to be able to protect it in often time periods before you had global fishing mega vessels that could, that could go around the world in, in open waters. Moving to the Inuit Circumpolar Council, moving away from bilateral treaties to larger groups, but larger groups of non-state actors, uh, is a, a council of indigenous populations in areas bordering the Arctic, first met in 1977. Um, it represents around 160,000 Inuit um, groups. Uh, they hold a general assembly meeting every four years. Um, and they quote in, the, in the, uh, the article that we read for this week, it's our right to freely determine our political status, freely presume our economic, social, cultural, and linguistic development, and freely pursue our natural wealth and resources. So it is a clear statement that the, these groups of people, even though they might cross international boundaries, had separate, distinct, important interests and areas that they cared about and wanted to protect, whether cultural uh, identity or economic resources that they wanted to organize and to try to protect. And so you see here that they have these different uh, groups in um, different countries, US, Canada, uh, Greenland, which is um, uh, governed by Denmark, and uh, in Russia as well. The 13th Assembly was in uh, 2018. Uh, in Alaska, and I don't, the four years would be 2022. Hopefully everything is, is uh, calmed down by then to allow for the next conference to occur in, in 2022. Moving on to the Arctic Council, in which you have an organization of states that border the Arctic region, um, Russia, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, um, Iceland, uh, Canada, and the U.S. You see the Arctic populations there can vary quite dramatically between Canada, 0.4% of the population versus Russia is 1.4%, um, or Norway with 10% 10, 10 you see where the uh, Spitsbergen Islands are. That's where that seed vault is in case the end of the world, there's this huge underground seed vault there to protect um, nature's biodiversity. Um, the Arctic Found, uh, Council was founded a couple of decades after the Inuit Circumpolar Council. It was founded in 1996. It's technically not an international organization, but a, a forum. It doesn't have a set budget with a headquarters um, with a permanent staff, uh, but it's rather a forum for discussion and potential collaboration uh, by interested parties. It's the leading in, um, uh, international forum related to the specific to uh, topic for uh, Arctic states, indigenous communities, and other inhabitants to talk about these specific issues. Um, the, the following members as of the latest Ottawa Declaration was Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, and Sweden, and the US. Um, so you have a relatively concrete number of um, countries that border the region that you are also having more and more um, organizations having like observer status um, to these uh, to the to the main ministerial meetings as well as to the working groups and there's six specific working groups that when you look at international organizations uh, and this uh, as a forum you can tell a lot about the issues that they're tasked with dealing with by the kind of working groups that they actually have IPCC also has their own set of working groups I had a screenshot of one of their meetings back in 2014 as in that section as well so a couple of quick, uh, a quick overview of the different working groups. There's the Arctic Contaminants Action Program, which is supposed to strengthen efforts to try to reduce emissions and other pollutants in the area. So having to deal with uh, pollution, um, monitoring and assessment to try to understand the Arctic environment, human populations and ecosystem um, to try to support governments as they try to tackle pollution and climate change. So you see a little bit of an issue area overlap, but more related to the environment and, and human uh, ecosystem there. Flora and fauna, this one is, is uh, focused on the living resources, not the human uh, or the pollutant side of things, but the flora and fauna in this, in this area that are often uh, quite fragile and 
occupied narrow, narrow um, ecological niches. The next one is dealing with the importance of search and rescue and the difficulty in op uh, operating in this area. So there's an emergency prevention, preparedness, and response working group to try to um, uh, protect the environment from the threat of pollutants or uh, radioactive uh, pollutants as well, which could be due to um, emergencies from extraction of resources. You talked about in the, we saw in the video, the Al Jazeera video about, um, I think it was Exxon um, talking about how uh, they would only develop without the, the worry of, of environmental risks. Although you have seen um, with uh, Exxon Valdez disaster, it wasn't up in the Arctic Circle, but it was the other part of Alaska. So it's, it can be quite difficult to deal with these issues and trying to prevent these kind of things is another one of their working groups. And then the, the next working group is looking at the marine environment, looking at um, not the flora and fauna on land, but the marines, you can break these all up, and then to sustainable development to try to improve the Arctic uh, communities that actually live there. So try to uh, recognize and to try to address the concerns of those, those peoples that might be represented in the Inuit um, um, Circumpolar Council. This is the latest ministerial meeting that I was uh, able to, to um, that, ha that has happened when you have um, the foreign ministers, uh, Sergei Lavrov, second to the left in the front there, and then you have uh, Secretary Pompeo there, fourth from the left there. So you have Russia, the US, and all the other um, uh, affected groups um, and states in that meeting. So you have the Arctic Council uh, as a forum for kind of working through these issues through the working groups and these high level kind of meetings, um, but doesn't kind of reach that level of solidified international law that either the Spitsbergen uh, Treaty um, did or the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea, um, which was signed uh, in um, 1982, replaced four existing treaties um, as you can see from your international cooperation classes you might have taken, often these norms evolve and get more complex um, over time and replace ad hoc treaties. It uh, basically solidified the fact that all countries that had a continental shelf um, that extended beyond the 200 nautical miles that was um, specified in the Spitsbergen Treaty can claim the natural resources under the ground up to 250 nautical miles. So that provided an extension of the country's rights to the resources under the ground 50 nautical miles further. Um, it would seem to benefit states to be able to agree to it, to be able to stake claim to these areas, uh, to these resources. U.S., like with the International Criminal Court and a whole uh, a series of other international agreements hasn't ratified, it relies instead on customary law, um, which is... Uh, um, had been used before the, the evolution of a lot of these treaties. Um, the, the one issue that I think is relevant for, uh, for the Arctic right now is the fact that Article 76 um, is problematic because the areas that countries... So when you claim um, the 250 nautical miles, you have, to you have to define what you consider your continental shelf. And so the... Um, the, the, Russia, the Russian claim with the Lermontsov Ridge um, hasn't, I don't think it's been adjudicated. I think there was hints as to be how it would um, be resolved back in 2019, but I couldn't see. But countries' claims uh, aren't visible until after they've been adjudicated. So um, you can't have any way of providing feedback or provide counter information until after uh, the other side uh, has already found out if they're gonna be winners or losers which is a weakness uh, of the organization. You have to wonder about how that strategically could be interested in the member states to try to preempt other sides by claiming certain areas, as well as to provide incentives for governments to undertake the research to decide where they're, or to do the science to figure out where their continental shelves uh, actually are. So the sixth area of um, Arctic cooperation, kind of like in the in the organization of uh, established complexity and cooperation, would be International Maritime uh, Organization. Um, it goes farther than just the laws of the sea because it is 
uh, a setting standard organization. Um, it's it uh, covers more than 80% of global trade. International shipping now covers more than 80% of global trade. It was created back in 1948, so one of the oldest organizations that we've looked at so far today as a setting standard authority for safety, security, and environmental performance for international shipping. And it's the regulatory framework for what would be um, for the shipping industry, to, to, for the standards that the shipping industry has to, has to follow. It, it's promoted some 50 uh, conventions and protocols, adapted more than a thousand codes and recommendations concerning maritime safety and security, the prevention of pollution, and other matters related to the polar regions. It doesn't just apply uh, to the polar regions, um, but it has jurisdiction over um, those, uh, those areas as well, and it's spearheaded, spearheaded efforts to try to um, to crack down on piracy off the off the off the Somali uh, coast and the Straits of Malacca over the last twenty years. It was crazy. I just saw in the headlines today um, that there was a a boat off uh, the Isle of Wight um, in uh, uh, off the coast of the UK. Um, a boat had been boarded and pirates were on board. I think um, the military were brought on board to to take care of it. But piracy is still an issue in in twenty twenty. So yeah, so basically the Interna International Maritime Organization helps um, to regulate the shipping lanes that my last shipment of things from the U.S. took. It is crazy the amount of information you can find out online. We've seen lots of different data sources in this class over the course of the semester. One you might not be aware of is you can basically track almost any commercial vessel um, within a day or two of their last current location online. Uh, more if you can, if you're willing to pay websites like uh, Vessel Finder. When I moved from the US uh, to, the U the, uh, to Australia, uh, we shipped a couple of different loads as we became more certain that we we're gonna spend the rest of our lives here in Australia. And you can track our shipment in the specific containers uh, around the world, which is kind of random. And kind of like with flight trackers, you can do the same thing for planes. You can also do the same thing for ships. Be interested to see how shipping also changed in the first months of the pandemic. Anyway, con specific connections to the International Maritime Organizations and the Arctic. Um, they passed 2009 guidelines for ships operating in polar waters. It exceeded to the polar code and related amendments um, so that it's... Um, uh, to make it mandatory under both the International Convention for the Safety of Life at Sea and Prevention of Pollution. Um, so you see an increasing effort at trying to get involved and to uh, create guidelines for ships in this new area in which they're going to be operating. Because it's International Maritime uh, Organization, as these new areas become international maritime uh, areas of activity, then they also become involved. And they've also become observer status for the uh, Arctic Council as of last year in 2019. So yeah, <sighs> deep breaths. We've covered a lot of territory looking at these kind of inter uh, international responses to environmental challenges. I've tried to cover a range from low complexity um, international norms that we operate by without necessarily always being aware of them, all the way to high complexity and coordination, like with the amount of codes um, and policies put forward by the International Maritime Organization since 1948. I think um, the IPCC water cooperation and the Arctic show the number of different uh, areas in which international cooperation has been undertaken and the number of activities in this area, which shows the breadth of both the policy implications of these changes that we've been looking at, the number of research opportunities to try to understand this quickly shifting um, uh, climate, economic, and political dynamics that we've looked at over the course of the class. And it just shows the dramatic changes in both the environment that we're actually looking at um, and the responses uh, to it as the number of mitigation and ad adaptation strategies that government, governments have tried to undertake and that uh, how we've tried to expand our understanding of what these changes mean for human security and the likelihood of, of violent conflict. So yeah, that is a lot for the kind of summary for the international responses that we've covered in this class. 
Um, I had one, I, I needed a third lecture question and I wanted, I always try to tie the lecture questions to the videos. Uh, so lecture question three would be what provocative intelligenic Russian act in 2007, as shown in the Al Jazeera video, was geared to bring attention to Russia's claims in the Arctic region. Um, if you watch the video, it should be pretty obvious. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's an opportunity to go back and try to see how governments um, can try to state claim state claims uh, to to areas that have new or important um, import for them. So that's the kind of wrap up for the international responses specific part of today. The next section I want to kind of wrap up major conclusions from the class, main takeaways that I've taken, the main themes I've tried to touch on, and um, areas for future research and opportunity for yourselves as citizens of the world or for in your jobs for how the skills um, that we've been able to practice in this class should hopefully be able to take you uh, and hold you in good stead in future years. So yeah, last video. Oh man, it goes, it goes quick.